This is Dr. James Marion broadcasting live on tape from the Susan and Leonard Feinstein Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center here at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. It's very hard to believe that it has been uh, a month since our last third Thursday broadcast. Uh, in the interim, New York has become uh, a COVID hotspot. So I'd like to devote uh, this third Thursday to uh, a COVID-19 IBD update from the front lines. And I've invited Dr. Ryan Ungaro back uh, to discuss some new understanding and knowledge that has come out of his, uh, the efforts that he spearheaded here in uh, the US looking at COVID specifically with IBD. Before we bring Ryan on, however, I wanna just briefly um, just point out that I've had a bit of a career change. I uh, have been deployed as have many of my colleagues uh, here uh, at Sinai for the last three weeks to run a 14-bed uh, uh, inpatient COVID unit here uh, at the hospital. We had started with 12 teams and now we're up to 32 teams taking care of these uh, very sick patients. Uh, I really have to say that the house staff, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the business clerks, the housekeepers, the maintenance teams, the pharmacists have all been mobilized and have valiantly taken up this common purpose. Uh, and I've never been prouder to be a member of the Mount Sinai faculty. We also have volunteers from Samaritan's Purse Organization who are very visibly out uh, uh, in tents in Central Park also caring for our patients. This morning we had uh, 1,841 patients uh, in our hospitals, 455 of those in intensive care units. And I think it's important to emphasize that we have discharged over 2,500 patients uh, uh, back to their homes uh, after their care here. We've enrolled dozens of patients in multiple clinical trials here. Uh, um, and we've been working very closely with our basic scientists to, to increase our understanding of this vicious vicious virus. Um, I wish I knew when this was gonna pass, but for now it depends entirely upon our ability to avoid spreading the virus to one another. I wanna send a special message out to our patients here at the IBD Center. And if you're a patient at any IBD Center or at IBD anywhere in the country or the world, our center is open via telemedicine uh, and I'm sure that you can reach your own physician by telemedicine now. It's changed radically now. We're doing more telemedicine. And our dedicated staff, our front staff, our nurses, our PAs, our nurse practitioners are all at the ready. Our infusion centers are operating uh, at full speed. I especially want to address those of you with IBD who are flaring and are frightened to come to the hospital. The hospital is, is functioning extremely well. Even with this pandemic going on, we are taking extremely good, careful, and considered care of our patients. And our commitment to delivering the state-of-the-art IBD care is as strong as ever here at Mount Sinai. If you are sick, please connect with your physician or the nurse practitioner. If you need to be hospitalized, our team is here to help care for you. Ryan, welcome back. Thanks, Jim, for having me. It's great to be it, back. It's so great to see you. You know, it's so strange. It's very hard to convey to everybody how isolated all of our lives have become. Either I'm seeing my patients in uh, the equivalent of a hazmat suit, or I'm only seeing you and all of our colleagues on Zoom when we round and meet. But it's really nice to see you, Ryan. I trust everybody in your house as well. Yes, thank you. Everyone's doing quite well. And um, yeah, this is the new normal, is uh, seeing each other on our webcams. Um, but you know, it's a necessary thing right now. And uh, it's just, it's great to, to still have uh, contact with all of our great colleagues with our regular updates we have every week exactly. with the whole GI division. Exactly. Ryan, um, I would love to hear from you uh, an update. Uh, first of all, let's go back and review for our viewers who don't recall what the Secure IBD database is about, and if you could explain that again and give us an update on its progress. Sure, thanks. So obviously a lot of our IBD patients are concerned about COVID-19 and how their IBD, and in particular their medications, uh, impacts their risk. 
uh, if they were to get COVID-19, are they at higher risk for more severe disease? So in order to ad address this question, do patients with IBD when they get COVID-19 have a more severe disease course or less severe disease course? About a month ago with um, our colleague at the IBD Center, Dr. Jean-Fred Columbell, and two colleagues at the University of North Carolina, Dr. Mike Kaplman and Dr. Erica Brenner, uh, we put together a online web-based uh, registry uh, for doctors to report any IBD patients who get COVID-19 anywhere around the world. Uh, so this is an international registry where we have patients from all around the world are getting entered. Um, and we ask them for basic information about the patients. So they have all sort of colitis, Crohn's disease, their age, comorbidities. And then we ask about um, if they had COVID, what happened to them? Um, and were they hospitalized? Did they need a ventilator, ICU? And um, you know, did they, did they die? Um, and so we, we have this comprehensive uh, large database now that started just about three weeks ago. Um, and up to uh, yesterday, through yesterday, Wednesday, we have 525 patients now reported in the registry. Wow, that is, that is spectacular to hear, Ryan. Um, and I know uh, a few of them are mine, unfortunately, now that this is spread around. Um, so any early information that you could share with us on some of the findings uh, from the database from SECURE? Sure, absolutely. So, you know, it is initial data, um, but we do have a good number of patients now, over 500. Um, so we can start to see some patterns. Um, I think one initial point is that um, the patients who do seem to get sicker when they get COVID-19, uh, patients with IBD who get sicker tend to follow the similar demographics, the characteristics of patients who we deem at risk in the general population, whether they have IBD or not. So patients who are older um, and patients with lots of comorbidities, um, so other medical problems. So what we've seen is that the majority of patients uh, in the cohort who have had um, a, a bad outcome, so unfortunately patients have died, uh, a small number, but some have died. Um, they, those patients do tend to be the older population, 70s, 80s, 90s, who in general are the highest risk for this, uh, for this virus, when they get this virus. Uh, also, we see that patients who have multiple medical problems in addition to their IBD, uh, two, three plus problems, uh, are the ones that are having a little bit more severe disease course as well. Um, so that's one, uh, one thing that we have, what we're seeing is that the general trends in the overall population do seem to hold in the IBD population as well. Um, some things that are more IBD specific to mention, um, two items that are higher risk or two features that are higher risk uh, which I think makes sense to a lot of us who take care of IBD patients, um, are disease activity and steroid use. And so these are things that we're constantly trying to deal with just on a regular basis. And now with the COVID uh, crisis uh, is brought into focus even more, that in our registry, we're seeing strong trends that if you have moderately to severely active disease, so your disease is not controlled, uh, having active inflammation, those patients are more likely to have a bad outcome. Um, so either being in the ICU, being ventilated, uh, or dying. Um, thankfully, it's small numbers that have had that outcome, but still there tends to be a trend there. And then the other uh, uh, risk factor for a poor outcome that we're seeing is oral steroid use. Um, so in particular, things like prednisone or prednisolone, uh, that patients on oral steroids uh, do seem to have a higher proportion in the uh, adverse outcome group. So those are risk factors. So you combine the known risk factors of the general population plus these two that are a little more IBD specific uh, tend to be uh, the patients who do get sicker if they have COVID-19. Right. So Ryan, may, may, so let me ask Ryan. So this is very helpful. So the risk factors parallel the risks in the general population in terms of comorbidities uh, and obviously age. And then an additional bit of data on steroids. And I know here at Sinai, we're very um, determined to try to get our patients off of steroids when we can. But it seems like now with the virus uh, at our heels, that should, we should be doubling down on that. One big question that I'm getting repeatedly and that I think we brought up last time, and I want to see if there's anything in the data that you're seeing about whether or not patients should be continuing with their biologic therapy. That is a a point of great concern. Um, so any data on anti-TNFs or vetilizumab, uh, 
uh, or maybe even any of the JAK kinase inhibitors, some of the newer medications our patients may be taking, uh, and COVID. Yeah, absolutely. So that's um, one of the main aims of the, the registry is to understand uh, if what, depending on what medication you're on, when you do get COVID-19, does that impact your outcomes? And, and right now, I think the data we see are reassuring um, that in general, patients on biologics, uh, like you said, anti-TNF, sustukinumab, vedalizumab, uh, in our initial look at the data, are not apparently having any higher risk of these poor outcomes than, than you would expect. Um, in fact, the anti-TNF population, which actually we have over um, 150 patients on anti-TNF monotherapy um, in, our, in our registry, um, those patients um, on some initial analyses do not seem to do um, uh, any worse at all than, than what you would expect in the general population. So the data is very reassuring that our medications, the biologics, um, are not increasing the risk of uh, severe outcomes. I would, the only word of caution I would say is for the non-TNF medications, we have a small... So Ryan, I just, yeah. yeah, let's just repeat that one more time because you got yeah. hung up there a little bit and I just want to make sure that everybody hears this, that the, there does not appear to be an increased risk of poor outcomes with respect to COVID if you're taking your biologic medicine so that is far correct. from the data. Good. So that, that is absolutely correct, yeah. But if you stop your medication, your disease becomes more severe, or if you require steroids as a result of that, you are putting yourself into a higher risk category. That is absolutely right. That, from our initial look at the data, everything suggests that. Um, that was a yeah. That was yeah. our that was our sense, but you know we had to be in equipoise until we got the results. But yeah. it's it's nice to see that that seems to be playing out. Absolutely. So Ryan, I, I really I cannot commend you and the group enough because uh, a lot of us feel that we're sort of sailing through very choppy waters without a a map or a chart, and it's very good to get some hard data and hard information to help guide us and our patients uh, through this uncertain time. So thank you very much, uh, Ryan. Um, uh, anything that the patients can do or their doctors can do to contribute to this effort of uh, this secure registry? Sure, yeah, so this is a registry that anyone can report into um, for physicians. So we are asking doctors around the world, we've been advertising through different physician organizations, uh, advocacy organizations uh, for any physicians taking care of IBD patients to report any known cases to our registry. It's very easy to go right onto our website, covidibd.org, um, and right on there it says report a case, and it takes less than five minutes to report a case. Um, and all reporters get acknowledged on our website and will be acknowledged in any uh, resulting publications as well. And for patients, you know, I think that an important thing is uh, if you or someone you know does get COVID, um, should let your doctor know or, or let your, your friend or family member know that they should tell their doctor about this website so that they can report cases as well so, so we can get a more complete data set. And I think the more patients we have in this cohort, uh, in this database, the better knowledge we're going to be able to generate. That is great. Well, listen, Ryan, I don't want to take up any more of your time. You're doing such a great job with this. Uh, this is Dr. Ryan Ungaro, Assistant Professor of Medicine here at Icon School of Medicine at uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, thank you again, Ryan. I have a hunch we're going to need another update in a month, uh, if you don't mind. So I'm, I want you to lock it in your calendar. Um, and this is Dr. James Marion working with my wonderful media team, uh, and Garcia, Chloe Politis, and Tilly Lafarge. Uh, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for putting this together for us. Uh, this is Dr. James Marion signing off on uh, our third Thursday, uh, taped live at the Susan and Leonard Feinstein IBD Center here at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City uh, in the hot zone of COVID. I look forward to seeing you all next month. <laughs>